Hey, what's up, guys? All right, this is recommended. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's only novel, the narrative of author Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Um, this was written, chapters of it were released when he was working in Richmond, but the novel, which was published in two volumes, uh, was published when he went to New York uh, with an with a actual publisher. Uh, it was not successful. Poe himself distanced himself from it, saying it was kind of silly. Uh, but it proved to be very popular in England. Now, reading this, uh, this every collection of Poe has this in it. Uh, this was published in 1838, about a decade before Moby Dick. Now, of course, there's, there's all kinds of influences before that, but uh, this is up there with it. I mean, this I, I'm not going to pull punches. This story is this horror in this. There's gore there's uh acts of sadism there's mystery there's a um tribes of savage treacherous uh, uh beings up in uh, the antarctica uh, there's other strange things there's there's all kinds of great writing this is very recommended uh, uh, of course why would i make a video if it wasn't recommended now the intro to this version, okay, I actually uh, got this version outside in uh, Cranberry, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh. And they mentioned something here, what is this? Jules Verne ingenuous sequel, Les Sphinx de Glace, okay, the Sphinx of, I think, ice, as translated into English. Well, why does there have to be a sequel to this? And there are a number of sequels to this. Why is that? Well, I'll explain. Right off the bat in the intro, it's interesting that uh, this was originally Poe planned this to be this guy Pym, like, you know, written by this this person describing something, kind of like the balloon hoax or some of the other works that were done where this was supposed to be like, oh, this actually happened. Who is this uh, Pym person? Uh, but uh, his name was associated with it early when it was still being published in the uh, Richmond magazine, the Southern Messenger, the, uh, yeah, the Southern Messenger so he was he wisely put his name in there as a character. Edgar Allan Poe is uh, basically writing this in the garb of fiction to describe right what happened to this young man. Yeah. So there's a bit of meta storytelling there. Uh, Arthur Gordon Pym is funny. He's like a teenage kid. He's sort of uh, I guess you'd say the hero, but the real hero or the the masculine presence in this that basically saves his ass all the time. Is Dirk Peters? Uh, Dirk Peters, a uh, four foot nine, uh, half breed Indian, uh, okay, who's a, who's ridiculously strong for his size, and a man of action. Uh, basically, this guy saves uh, Arthur Gordon Pym many, many times in the narrative. Um, and so I'll just uh, get a sample of reading. It's funny how it starts out where he's a kid and he he, hang, he gets into this. Uh, world of adventure with a very uh, foolish, drunk, other old, slightly older uh, kid uh, who gets drunk, and then they go out on the for a fun on the ship, and then uh, are close to dying from the cold. So it's very, very funny. So here's your reading. Hardly had I come to this resolution, when suddenly a loud and long scream or yell, as if from the throats of a thousand demons seemed to pervade the whole atmosphere around and above the boat. Never will I live. Never while I live shall I forget the intense agony or of terror I experienced at that moment. My hair stood erect on my head. I felt the blood congealing in my veins. My heart ceased utterly to beat. Without having once raised my eyes to learn the source of my alarm, I tumbled headlong and insensible upon the body of my fallen companion. Yeah. So Arthur Gordon Pym, the hero, does this a lot. I mean, he he would have been a, he would have been dead many times if it wasn't for uh, this character later, this Dirk Peters character, who in, in some ways I guess kind of steals the show a little bit. But you know, Pim's a likable lad. I mean, what he what they go through and they go through a lot of stuff. This is an incredibly gruesome novel. Uh, there's scenes in it uh, which which I'm surprised that Poe actually wrote. Back then in 1830, whatever, it, it would have been scandalous, you'd say. Right? So let's see what else we got. Uh, we'll go to a scene here. 
All right, I'll, I'll give you an example of the gruesomeness of it. And, and at this point, this is where they're on a ship that's already, the sails have been destroyed, there's been storms, and they're on a, it's on a uh, halfway sinking ship that's moving along, uh, drifting aimlessly. There's hardly any food, hardly any water. Uh, there's some wine. They're trying to catch fish. There's sharks everywhere looking to, to, to eat their asses. So I'll read this. We always like to journal, all right? Continuing to the same calm weather with an impressively hot sun. Suffered exceedingly from thirst, the water in the jug being absolutely putrid and swarming with vermin. We contrived under, nevertheless to swallow a portion of it by mixing it with wine. Uh, our thirst, however, was but little abated. We found more relief by bathing in the sea, but could not avail ourselves of this expedient except, uh, ex except at long intervals on account of the continual presence of sharks. Predators of the sea. Yeah, they're waiting. They know what's good. They're doing their job. Right? We now clearly saw that Augustus could not be saved. This is the guy that, this, this is the older kid that brings uh, Arthur Gordon Pym, uh, sneaks him on the ship, this whaling ship, that then gets involved with mutiny and all kinds of uh, goings on. Uh, and he was injured, all right, and he was dying. We could do nothing to relieve his sufferings, which appeared to be great. About 12 o'clock, he expired in strong convulsions without having spoken for several hours. His death filled us with the most gloomy forebodings and had so great an effect upon our spirits that we sat motionless by the corpse during the whole day and never addressed each other except in a whisper. It was not until some time after dark that we took courage to get up and throw the body overboard. It was then loathsome beyond expression and so far decayed that as Peters attempted to lift it, an entire leg came off in his grasp. Damn. Imagine reading this. In 1830-something, uh, as the mass of putrefaction slipped over the vessel's side into the water, the glare of phosphoric light with which it was surrounded plainly discovered to us seven or eight large sharks, the clashing of whose horrible teeth as their prey was torn to pieces among them might have been heard at the distance of a mile. We shrunk within ourselves in the extremity of horror at the sound. Ha! Oh, and they're, they're not even through it all yet. So, now, it's funny, eventually they're, they're found, and they end up on another ship that goes to the Pole. I think it's the Southern Pole, I forgot which, to be honest. And they run into a, a group of natives, okay, and this is where the controversy of this a book comes into play. A lot of people that, uh, that are put up now uh, did not like this even back in the day, and we're mentioning it uh, where Poe uses the ideas of darkness and light, black and white, ebony uh, and ivory, right? Like the song. Uh, he brings this up uh, into a very politically incorrect uh, scenario of uh, these uh, these natives that live up there. That, um, well, let's just say they're uh, they're uh, very dark, okay. And uh, they actually betray the group they're with, with. And him and that guy, Peters, Dirk Peters, watch as this ship is taken over by the uh, natives and they butcher the crew. But then there's a scene here where uh, they accidentally set the thing on fire and the gunpowder explodes. And uh, they take a little pleasure in this sort of uh, delayed justice. Uh, the havoc among the savages far exceeded our utmost expectation and they had now indeed reaped the full and perfect fruits of their treachery yeah perhaps a thousand perished by the explosion while at least an equal number were desperately mangled the whole surface of the bay was literally strewn with the struggling and drowning wretches and on the shore matters were even worse they seemed utterly appalled by the sudden and completeness of their discomfiture and made no efforts at assisting one another at length we observed a total change in their demeanor from absolute stupor, they appeared to be all at once aroused to the highest pitch of excitement and rushed wildly about, going to and from a certain point on the beach with the strangest expressions of mingled horror, rage, and intense curiosity depicted on their countenances and shouting at the top of their voices, Tekalili, Tekalili. Whoa, wait a minute, where is that from? Well, uh, as if you know... <laughs> Uh, this is the the uh, the Shagoths say this in at the mountains of madness, out the at the mountains out the mount at the mountains of madness I was influenced greatly by this novel. 
Um, sure, Lovecraft meant this many times. And in fact, uh, somebody actually wrote a, a, a sequel of this where um, the Arthur Gordon Pym is a prequel to At the Mountains of Madness, where Arthur Gordon Pym discovers the, uh, the ancient city and the Shoggoths. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, I mean, it's pretty much a homage there that you could see literary, you know, in a, in a hundred year gap. Anyway, so now we get a scene here where uh, here's something I want to get at. Where he's, they're basically going, him and Derek Peter, Dirk Peters are the only survivors. Uh, and they're, they're going through a strange labyrinth. And it's interesting. Oh, all right, this is live, folks. Hold on a second. Uh, there's an old book. Where is it? If I could find it. This, these figures here. This is very... Poe was a big fan of puzzles and games uh, that you had back then. Uh, obviously, the gold bug is another one where there's actually literally a game uh, in the story. There's a, a, there's a, there's a grid... Uh, to figure out a clue. And of course there's the other one. Uh, my, the uh, the chess player. The Mizell's chess player. Where there's actually a picture drawn in there. Of the auto automaton that plays chess. And that beats everybody. Now I don't know if Poe drew this. I, I guess I should look into it. Whether he actually drew this. You actually see illustrations in his work. And I just lost it. Hold on. Hey Danae. Anyway, the whole point is that this, um, this little thing here, um, the, uh, the illustrations, the tunnels they were in were shaped in the form of writing. There's, there's basically a hint that uh, this world that they, uh, this Antarctica that they went to had been discovered before by other civilizations, ancient civilizations, and they actually had a name for it okay when they bring up the terms of darkness right and uh white oh boy uh, aren't we always going over those terms right uh, here we go and so him and the guy are going through this like some kind of role-playing game or some kind of uh uh strategy game and the the tunnels make out an inscription which is explained at the end but what happens at the end well I'm going to give away the secret, not so much of what happens at the end, but of what literally happens at the end. Where, uh, surprise, you don't get to see the end. The chap the last uh, chapter ends with, po with uh, Pim discovering some strange being, a giant being uh, uh, who is as white as the other ones were not white. And then all of a sudden it ends like this where uh, Poe is now writing that, yeah, the circumstance, we lost, I lost the rest of his, uh, his uh, journal. I lost the entries. And so it just ends like that. And uh, Pim somehow died at some point later. And so I don't have the rest of the story. So that's how it ends mysteriously. Uh, I think it's brilliant. Uh, but this, uh, this really uh, vexed a lot of people. Uh, Jules Verne was probably one of them. There were so many people that were like, that's the end? Uh, that <laughs> they actually... Some people wrote sequels to this or uh, tried to figure out what exactly happened, what this apparition at the end was. Is everything from it was a sail of a ship to a statue uh, to whatever, to maybe a Shoggoth in that story I had mentioned. Uh, and it's like I said, it's, it's just interesting how uh, Poe's... Uh, cryptograms and and these kind of word games and stuff like that he really enjoyed he integrated into the illustrations uh, so that is Arthur Gordon Pym and I'm just gonna leave something at the end here I just like this bit of writing because I want to give you a little thing before this ends right uh, there was a ringing in my ears and I said this is my knell of death and now I was consumed with the irrepressible desire of looking below. I could not I would not confine my glance to the cliff and with a wild indefinable emotion Half of horror, half of a relieved depression. I threw my vision far down into the abyss. For one moment, my fingers clutched convulsively upon their hold, while with the movement, the faintest possible idea of ultimate escape wandered like a shadow through my mind. And the next, my whole soul was pervaded with a longing to fall. Right? 
sounds like a, a band name, right? Uh, that is the European Nordic Neanderthal Faustian view to the wanting to fall into oblivion. Uh, that's thoroughly shown by the first uh, modern writer of the macabre. Salute all salutations to Edgar Allan Poe later.